brothers in Christ. I have one quick announcement, uh, and that is there is the email went out uh, this last week announcing the men's retreat registration. Um, <clears throat> but what I didn't do was print registration forms. So the registration forms are not out in the foyer as of yet, but at least you have all the information. Hopefully you guys have been, <clears throat> we've made actually, I think, two announcements about, th that was the third announcement about the men's retreat. And I think we started back in March. So you guys have had plenty of time to, uh, to be thinking about it. And we're going to start going into full-blown prep mode now that July 4th is over. So men's retreat, <clears throat> um, let me reemphasize that we do not want anyone missing the men's retreat because of a lack of funds. So don't let that deter you from attending. That's number one. Number two, if anyone is inter interested in offering any kind of sponsorships, uh, please see Pastor Reggie Bembry. Pastor Reggie is going to be handling all of the registrations <clears throat> regarding men's retreat. So please see him if you have any questions about it. Uh, I'm handling all the teaching stuff, so you can talk to him about <coughs> registration stuff. Alrighty? So that's that. Uh, Johnny already said thank you, but I too want to just say thank you guys for last Monday. Monday was, was excellent. Uh, we had a great experience um, on the July 4th outreaches. I know that numerous seeds were planted, numerous seeds were watered, God blessed us with good weather, little on the warm side, but at least it wasn't humid. It was really a good day, and folks, let us rejoice in what we were able to do last week. I am now, of course, my sights are set on the Prince William County Fair, and I hope to see many of you sign up for an opportunity to be involved in the fair, and uh, that's coming up in about four yeah, four weeks, exactly four weeks, one month from this weekend. So <clears throat> we'll have another opportunity to do some outreach. Uh, I, I just can't say how delighted I am. I can't say enough how delighted I am because of last, uh, last Monday. I'm still sort of beaming from that a little bit. We had a very, very busy time at the Manassas City outreach. And so I, I always look forward to those opportunities uh, to get out with you guys with, as a group, and I'm glad that we're doing everything we're doing on, on Sundays, a uh, small group that goes out every week. <clears throat> Great time to be pointing people to Christ. The days that we live in, time is getting short. Actually, I'm not going to go into that now because I'm going to be talking about that in just a second. So let's go ahead and get on to onto our lesson for today. Last week, as you'll recall, that we sort of changed course from our first Peter study, and instead we talked about evangelism. And it was really nice to have the opportunity to do an outreach the day after teaching that. So let's get ready to talk about evangelism once again. <clears throat> I mentioned that this was going to be, I was going to need a part two, and this is part two. Today is my plan anyway, is to finish the teaching on evangelism, and uh, so let's go ahead and pray together, and let's get into this. I have a lot to cover. I'm hoping it's not going to be a part three. It's not going to be a part three. I'm just going to keep everybody here for a long time, so <laughs> that's the way it's going to go, at least I think. We'll see, but let's pray. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for how you've opened up our hearts, Lord, with all those songs that we just sang. You are indeed our King. You are our Lord. And what an amazing thing, an amazing love, <clears throat> that you, my King, would die for me. And Lord, indescribable. It is hard to describe you, Lord, and yet you have given us words to describe you. So on the one hand, Lord, your glory is so magnificent, it exceeds the boundaries you've created. Nevertheless, Lord, you have created boundaries. And nevertheless, you have given us words to describe you. 
words that we can use to exclaim our love for you. And as limited as we are in our frailness and our humanity, Lord, you have given us a capacity to praise you, to love you, to serve you, Lord. You are infinite, we are finite, and yet, Lord, we can love you. Lord, you have set your love upon us as your church. You have given us the ability to serve you. Lord, we thank you for that opportunity to serve you. We thank you, Lord God, that you have visited our hearts, that you have awakened us, Lord, to our need for you. <clears throat> and God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for saving us. Father in heaven, as we prepare right now to look into the scriptures and to read a lot of verses, Lord, would you speak to us? Lord, would you give us hearts that want to reach out to this lost world? Lord, we know that there is a treasure that is in our hearts, Lord. There is a deposit that you have made, the deposit of your Holy Spirit, Lord. It's there. If we are born again, Lord, we are new creations in Christ, and we have something to talk about. We have something to proclaim. So, Lord, open our hearts today and help us to see our need to share our faith, to evangelize. And so, Lord, we commit this these next few moments to you. And we ask, Lord God, that you would instruct us and teach us in the way that we should go. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. and amen. <clears throat> well, I'm gonna jump right into this. You guys ready? Let me get ready here, take a sip. Well, in our last session, <clears throat> we focused on, excuse me, <laughs> we focused on four reasons <clears throat> why all Christians are to evangelize the lost, why all Christians should be available to witness to those who are unsaved. Those four reasons were, number one, because God commands us to. I mean, that's just cut and dry right there, because God commands us to. The Great Commission tells us <clears throat> that we are to make disciples of which evangelism is a necessary part of that. A verse that I didn't read last week, Psalm 60 verse four, says that you have given a banner to those who fear you that it may, that it may be displayed because of the truth. Yes, indeed, God wants to parade us around, if you will. God wants to exhibit us as his chosen ones. God wants to show us off, so to speak, to show the world the work that he can do in a human heart. And he does that <clears throat> when we open our mouths and evangelize. Number two, we witness to people because, quite frankly, we owe it to God and we owe it to people. How could we not open our hearts and instruct people from the Bible about their need to repent and believe the gospel? And we looked at Romans 1 last week where Paul says, I am a debtor, both to the Jews and to the Greeks. Number three, we evangelize, we do it because it's wise. We saw from Proverbs 10 that the person who wins souls is called wise. It's really very simple. Number four, we share our faith. We witness to God's truth because of the fate of the unrighteous who die without Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.11 says, knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing therefore the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. That was last week. Today is part two. And today I'm going to be covering a variety of things related to the subject of evangelism. Like I said previously, I'm not going to try and reinvent the wheel. 
For our purposes, I am going to walk us through a whole bunch of passages that I hope will instruct our hearts fully on this subject. I am sure that there are some here today who are committed to these principles and who already practice them. Others may not. I believe the verses that we cover will search all of us out. So, here's what I want to do first. The next thing I want to address is why Christians are weak or hesitant in their efforts to evangelize the lost. Reasons why we don't. Here we go. Reason number one, fear. Fear. Fear based on peer pressure, fear based on being afraid of persecution, fear of maybe not knowing enough. Now, inadequacy is gonna be another point later on, so I'm not gonna expound on that anymore at this moment. But whatever the, the cause of the fear, fear comes in many shapes and sizes. Whatever the cause, fear is a legitimate reason why believers do not share their faith. So let's address this. 2 Timothy chapter one, would you turn there? 2 Timothy chapter one. <clears throat> Second Timothy chapter one. And we're going to begin reading in verse one. Verse one says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, according to the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my beloved son, Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's the introduction. Verse three. I thank God, whom I serve with a clear conscience, <clears throat> with a clear conscience the way my forefathers did, as I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day, longing to see you, even as I recall your tears, so that I may be filled with joy. Now, for those of you who do not know, Paul had a very deep, profound, personal love for Timothy, and he considered him to be a grounded fellow soldier of the faith. Paul loved Timothy. Notice what he says next. For I am mindful of the sincere faith within you, which first dwelt in your grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice, and I am sure that it is in you as well. So Timothy here is reminded of his own godly heritage, a mother and a grandmother who loved God. But Timothy also had his own relationship with God. And this was in part due to the fact that his godly family raised him in the scriptures. Now, how many of the younger generation in this fellowship have a relationship with God and can reflect on an upbringing that moved you Godward? Think about that. Think about all the people that God used in your life, young person, to get you where you are today spiritually. And then in light of that, think about that as we read the next verse. Because he says... For this reason, I remind you to kindle afresh the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline, or as the King James says, a sound mind. So here, Timothy is being exhorted by Paul to stir up the deposit that resided within him. God's saying to Timothy that, or excuse me, Paul is saying to Timothy that God has equipped you. So in this case, 
Paul is specifically referring to a gift that Timmy obviously had, a gift of proclamation. Timothy was called by God to declare God's word. Timothy had a gifting to do this. God doesn't want fear or timidity to hold anyone back from what we should be saying in his name. Now, what was the likely cause of Timothy not being stirred? Well, notice in verse 8, the stated source of fear. He says, therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. Now, in this case, it happened to be the fear of persecution, the fear of being associated with someone like Paul. It was costly to be known as an associate of the apostle Paul. Paul got into a lot of trouble because of his proclamation of the gospel, because of his evangelistic efforts, especially in areas with Jewish synagogues. But here in verse 8, Paul is saying, join with me in this suffering. Embrace this. The believer has to resist the temptation of letting fear keep us from opening our mouths. And sometimes we do. Notice what he says next, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, Remember, we're debtors. Not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted us in Christ Jesus from all eternity, but now has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel, for which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle and a teacher. Now, it is true that we might not all be appointed as preachers, apostles, or teachers. But, as we saw last week, we are all appointed as ambassadors. Every Christian is an ambassador for Christ. Every Christian is a witness to what Jesus Christ has done. Verse 12 goes on to say, it's for this reason that I also suffer all these things, but I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and I am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him until that day. In fact, I I think verse 12 is very similar to what we read last week where Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The final words in this exhortation, verse 13, he says, retain the standard of sound words which you have heard from me in the faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. Guard through the Holy Spirit who dwells in us the treasure which has been entrusted to you. Timothy, Don't let the fear of what may happen because you open your mouth for the Lord. Don't let the fear of the consequences of that hold you back from that precious deposit that God has put in your heart. Open your mouth and let the chips fall where they fall. Let let the knowledge that you have of me, of the Lord, the Lord says, let that knowledge be proclaimed. Let it be shared in conversation and do not fear the consequence as a result. Now, as we saw last week, Jesus promises to always be with us as we obey him to reach the lost. And there are countless verses to substantiate this. Get a concordance and look up the phrase, fear not and see for yourself. All the different times the Lord says, I'll be with you, I'll be with you, I'll be with you, I'll be with you, I'll be with you. It's all over the place. But there is always that need for us to beware of the fact 
that fear, fear is an excellent tactic of the enemy to keep us from opening our mouths. So number one, number one reason why we sometimes hold back is fear. We have to set that aside and realize that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Number two, second reason why we do not witness, why Christians do not witness. Because sometimes we are too worldly-minded. We are too focused on temporal things. Turn with me, if you will, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Now, this reason may be a little bit tough to admit. But the fact is, some believers rarely share their faith with unbelievers. Some Christians rarely ever share their faith. They just don't think about it that much because they are so focused on the temporal. And this is not good. In fact, this is sin. So let the verses that we cover <clears throat> on this particular reason, let, this verse, let these verses that we cover correct this mindset if we happen to be guilty of it. So 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the first thing I want to direct your attention to <clears throat> regarding this reason why some don't share their faith is having this, this eternal mindset. 1 Corinthians 7, 29, <clears throat> this section begins this way. But this I say, brethren, the time has been shortened so that from now on those who have wives should be as though they had none and those that weep as though they did not weep, and those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice, and those who buy as though they did not possess, and those who use the world as though they did not make full use of it, for the form of this world is passing away. Now get that last line there. Here's the reality. One day we are going to die. <clears throat> One day, the world as we know it is going to vanish and we are going to be ushered into the eternal realm. So that is why it's saying here, let it be that those who have wives <clears throat> should be as though they have none. That doesn't mean ignore the things that God has given us the responsibility to do, but always handle it with a very light touch because it's temporal. It really is temporal. These verses, I think, we should memorize and we should recall them frequently. This is actually a summary statement of what should be our overall attitude about the legitimate earthly activities that we engage in. Again, we know that our time is short and we have to maintain, <clears throat> as Christians, a heavenly perspective at all times. Worldly mindedness has a way of dulling our ability to grasp the spiritual realm that God wants us to stay focused on. And the words of 1 Corinthians 7 are perfectly illustrated in numerous passages, but we are going to look at two passages related to what we just read in 1 Corinthians 7. First, I would like us to go to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, the Gospel of John. So turn to the left from Corinthians. <clears throat> John chapter 4. So we are told, time is short. Those who weep should be as though they did not weep. Those who rejoice as though they did not rejoice. Though they buy, those that buy as though they did not possess. We do have to buy, right? And we do have to use this world. <clears throat> but moderation is the key. Heavenly perspective is the key. Now here in John chapter four, we're jumping right into the middle of a situation. Jesus has just ministered to a sinful woman at a well. His dialogue with her is complete, at least where we're coming into the story. 
her life has now been changed forever. Jesus ended up alone with this woman because the disciples had gone to get food. Remember that? So now the disciples have returned with the food and we're jumping right into the midst of that. We're gonna pick it up in verse 31. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him saying, Rabbi, eat. Chapter four, verse 31. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples were saying one to another, no one brought him anything to eat, did he? (laughs) Jesus said to them, take note of this, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months, excuse me, and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields that they are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and is gathering fruit for life eternal so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored and others have labored and you have entered into their labor. Now, as we think about what Jesus just said, we understand, of course, that Jesus didn't mean that physical food was unnecessary. In fact, he probably ate the food they brought later on. His point here was meant to instruct them. Jesus was saying to his disciples that his goal, his ultimate goal was the Father's will. And his sustenance was spiritual food. And this was something that he was constantly pressing upon the disciples, the need to see that God was providing something more necessary than their daily food. That was actually the point of multiplying the the bread and the loaves, or excuse me, the, the loaves and the fishes. The point in multiplying that was to give a lesson to the disciples of God's provision. He didn't just do that to feed people. Later on, he rebuked the people who were following him after he fed them. He rebuked the people for following him because he fed them. He said he was trying to show them a spiritual lesson too. And that is how God provides. And so in the thick of self-preservation, and personal stewardship of the things of this life, there is a need to keep heavenly realities before our eyes at all times. And it's very difficult to do. But it's something that we have to fight to do. Let me give you another example of this, of of someone resisting the urge to focus on the temporal and look away from the, te- from the spiritual. Turn with me again <laughs> to 2 Timothy. So go to the right to 2 Timothy, and this time we're going to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter two, and we're gonna begin reading in verse eight. Follow these words. Verse eight says, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, descendant of David, according to my gospel, for which I suffer hardship even to imprisonment as a criminal But notice he says that the word of God is not imprisoned. And then he says this. This is eternal perspective right here. For this reason, I endure all things for the sake of those who were chosen so that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus and with it eternal glory. He says, I do it for the sake of those who were chosen. He's referring to those who are not yet saved. He says, so that they may obtain salvation, 
which is in Christ Jesus, and with it eternal glory. Now, I think verse 10 should be read as Paul's mission statement. Although the sufferings that he endured were strongly felt, he willingly endures them for he recognizes that they have a moral and spiritual eternal purpose. Here he sets his sufferings in the gospel ministry inside the much larger framework of God's eternal choice of his people for salvation, which will eventually bring them eternal glory with Christ. The scriptures declare that God has chosen his own before the foundation of the world. He set his love upon the lowliest of this earth so as to magnify the nature of his grace. Now, there is a common criticism about the doctrine of, doctrine of election, and that common criticism is that the doctrine of election will weaken the evangelistic impulse of God's people. Note, however, <clears throat> that the fact of election did not undercut the apostles' mission, missionary zeal. Rather, it fed his missionary zeal. Paul here says that he endured all manner of suffering so that they, the elect, also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. The purpose for the grinding difficulty, for the disgrace and the discomfort of Paul's life was so that the grace of God might reach those whom God had chosen to enjoy eternal life. And Paul didn't know who they were. He just knew he needed to reach people. And that was his life's mission. Paul had a very clear sense that his obedience and endurance in spreading the gospel was essential if these people, he says, also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. So what Paul and other believers enjoyed, he knew he must make certain that other people had the opportunity to enjoy that also. So Paul saw the process of reaching the elect as, an, as important as the fact of their having been chosen. There had to be sacrifices, <clears throat> there had to be the sacrifice of reaching them with the gospel. So Paul here has the entire panorama of salvation in view. From the first work of the Spirit in awakening the heart to the truth of the gospel, all the way to the final glorification in eternity. Folks, there are people that God has every intention to save and he wants to put you and I right in the middle of his saving purpose. There are divine encounters that God wants us to connect with. And so this means that our hearts need to be in tune with this. And this is one of the purposes that God has for all believers. Remember what Paul told, or excuse me, what the Lord Jesus told Paul about Corinth? He said, I have many people in that city. Before he sent them there, he said, I have a lot of people in that city that I intend to save, and I'm sending you into that city. Many years ago, Keith Green wrote that song, <clears throat> open your eyes, open your eyes to the world all around you, open your eyes, open your eyes, the world is much more than the things that surround you, open your eyes, open your eyes. So we have to make sure that we are not so worldly minded <clears throat> that we are losing sight that God wants to use us to reach people for Christ, amen? Amen. 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 Reason number three, why is it that some Christians don't evangelize? Reason number three, inadequacy. We just don't feel prepared. I don't feel like I know what I'm gonna say. I don't have the confidence of knowing that if I talk to someone, I'm gonna say the right thing. And this is actually related to the problem of fear. Sometimes we fear to share our faith because we feel like, right, we don't know enough. Well, 
Let's remember what we covered two weeks ago. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Sanctify Christ Jesus as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. We are commanded to be ready. Inadequacy is something we overcome by seeking to be ready. Now, I mentioned uh, last week when we began this that Charlie Campbell, many years ago, came here and did a teaching on evangelism. And in fact, uh, he entitled his preaching The Cures for the Fear of Evangelism. And actually, what I'm talking about on this point is the first item on his list of things. He listed seven cures for the fear of evangelism. And here's what he said in his teaching. He said, so the first cure for the fear of evangelism is number one, to know the gospel. He said, I believe that every ambassador of Christ, every Christian should have at least a handful of verses related to the gospel committed to memory so that when the opportunity, opportunities arise to share the gospel, you can explain the good news to somebody. Then he goes on to give a list of verses. John 3.16, uh, the Romans road is a very common one, what we call the Romans road. Acts 4.12 John 14, 6, right? Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. Acts 17, 30. I have the list up here. If you want it, you can come up and get it later. He said, these are a great place to start. Write one down on a post-it note and stick it on your bathroom mirror <clears throat> for a week or two, then go to the next one. And soon enough, you'll have them all memorized. In addition to having a firm grasp on the gospel, it's also immensely helpful for an ambassador to be able to answer the common objections and questions that non-believers bring up. For example, the Bible was written by men and it isn't trustworthy. Or why does God allow evil and suffering? Or how can you say Jesus is the only way of heaven? And we learned at the fair or the, the, the outreach this last week that there's new questions there's always new questions. There's always some reason why the world is gonna to wanna to reject the gospel and there is always a need for us to be prepared. And look, don't ever be surprised when you open your mouth to share your faith if you don't get your head handed to you on a platter because it happens at, at times. I remember one time years ago, I was attempting to evangelize a person and I didn't know they were a Jehovah Witness. And the person was ready for dealing with the subject of the Trinity. And I, quite frankly, was not. I was a new believer. And so they gave their reasons why they didn't believe in the Trinity. I knew they were wrong, but I didn't know how to tell them they were wrong. So I went and did my research back then. This is before computers. So I copied all these pages out of the Bible and highlighted them in yellow and went back with this big stack of papers and set it on her desk. Said, here you go, right here, you know. <clears throat> so there was, there was preparation involved. <clears throat> None of us know everything. Nobody does. We're all in need of learning. It's a skill that we're honing all the time. One writer said this. Don't run from evangelism thinking you are not prepared. If you are a Christian, I'm assuming, I'm talking, I'm speaking to the Christian today, okay? If you are a Christian and you know something about the scriptures, God has enabled you to be able to speak. Speak as one in the presence of God, obeying the commandment of God, not as one trying to measure up to the standard that you see in teachers around you. God didn't put your teacher in the middle of that discussion. He put you there, so speak. Just speak. But that is one of the reasons why some people hold back or are afraid to. They don't feel like they know enough. You know enough. If you're born again, you know enough. You might know, only know your testimony, but you know enough to say something. Final instructions. The last thing I want us to look at <clears throat> is 
a passage in the Bible that I think provides some very helpful direction regarding personal evangelism. I find this to be my favorite instruction on evangelism in the New Testament. I'd like you to turn to Colossians chapter four. Go to the right, or excuse me, to the left from 2 Timothy and go to Colossians chapter four. I like this admonition in Colossians four because the truth of the matter is most of my witnessing encounters do not take place at an outreach event. Evangelism is a way, is to be a way of life. We interact with people almost daily. And throughout the course of living out our lives, God wants us to be ready to be a witness for him anywhere. Now, of course, it can be in outreaches. But it could also be on the job. It could be at a restaurant. It could be at a store. It could be anywhere. So I find what is stated in Colossians chapter four to be very helpful. Colossians chapter four, and we are going to pick it up in verse two. Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I also have been imprisoned, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Verse five, conduct yourself with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Now, let's back up and let's walk through this real quickly. I think much of what is needed to understand our responsibility in the matter of evangelism is found right here in this very simple admonition. First of all, verse two, simple thing says, devote yourself to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. There is, of course, the matter of a prayer life. It stands to reason that none of us will be an effective witness for the Lord without a prayer or devotional life, right? So that's, we know that. Hopefully we know that. But notice here, there's a life of personal prayer. Then he adds this in verses three and four. Praying at the same time for us as well that God will open up to us a door for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ for which I have also been imprisoned that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So this was actually a very common request for Paul and his colleagues. Pray for me that I could make the word of God known the way I should. He says in verse three, pray that God will open up to us a door for the word. So Paul requested that they pray for an open door for the gospel. An open door in the New Testament usually refers to an opportunity. His success was because he looked to the Lord to supply the wisdom for the opportunity. At the end of Paul's first missionary journey, he and Barnabas reported to the church all things that God had done with them and how he, God, had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, there was another instance when God shut a ministry door for him. Believers are to pray for open doors because it is God who opens those doors for them. Obviously, the work, the work that the word <coughs> does is not something that we humans ourselves can accomplish. This word will only do the work 
that God wants it to do when God opens the door. Notice he says also in verse three, so that we may speak forth, he says, the mystery of Christ. So when God does open a door, the responsibility of servants of the gospel like Paul is very clear. He says that when God opens that door, he is to speak. He says he is to declare the mystery of Christ. Now, it is interesting that Paul uses the designation mystery and not just the term the gospel. Now, of course, it's both. But mystery is the term that shows that this, that this is something that Paul was to disclose. This is something that Paul opened up to people. Helping people to know the God of heaven is what he is needing prayer for. And we have the same mission. People are lost. People are wayward. The mysteries of heaven are concealed from them because the Bible says regarding Satan, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving so that they might not see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so we're, <clears throat> what we do is we come in and we open to them the realities of this. God uses us to help them to see this. Notice he also says in verse three, for which I have also been in prison. Paul's commitment to proclaim the mystery led to his imprisonment. Now, this may or may not happen to us. We actually still enjoy a great deal of religious liberty today in the United States of America. And even though there, although we know that there has also been a, a downgrade of religion and morality in our country, and so we can anticipate ever increasing hostility toward Christianity. Nevertheless, we share. But notice what he says in verse four. He says, pray this way that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. So this speaks of how imperative he is, it is that he speaks, that he makes, it, makes the case right. The word ought here can be understood in two ways. First, it refers to the compulsion that Paul felt to preach the gospel. This was actually the constant burden of his life. He said in 1 Corinthians 9.16, If I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I am under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So Paul says this is something I ought to do. Number one. Number two, the word ought also refers to the mandate for using the God-ordained method of preaching or presenting the gospel. Paul preached the gospel by, he said in Acts 20, sol solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there are a number of things that can pre prevent us from not sharing the gospel <clears throat> or cause us to wrongly communicate the gospel. The temptation to say nothing at all because of fear, which we've already talked about, might cause us to shrink back from making it known as we ought. There's the reality of peer pressure this can cause believers to soften the message. Pragmatic considerations can weigh very heavily on a person's heart and mind and strongly influence the ability to be upfront. For example, who wants, to, who wants to tell a group of mourners at a funeral service for an unsaved relative that the person who has died is not going to heaven if they didn't repent of their sins? Who wants to say that? So sensitive situations can easily make us hold back from speaking the truth as we ought. God doesn't always open doors that are easy to walk through. Remember I read to you last week from 1 Corinthians 16, 8, 
that says, but I will remain in Ephesus until Pentecost for a wide door for effective service has, has been opened to me and there are many adversaries. <laughs> so the door might open up, <clears throat> but there could be a lot of opposition. Paul says to the Colossians, pray for me regarding this because we need open doors to share our faith. But lastly, I'll try to wrap this up quick. <clears throat> Verse five and six, look at that again. Then he says, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. Let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you will know how you should respond to each person. So here the apostle is making two appeals, one having to do with how Christians are to live and the other ha has to do with how we are to relate to people through our speech. Verse five says to be wise in the way that you act toward outsiders. This means that we are to show practical Christian wisdom in dealing with secular society. Wisdom though, as it's being used here, is not some kind of corrective to the Christian life as though Paul were saying that it is all very well to be enthusiastic about Christ, but in your dealings with outsiders, be wise. In other words, don't be too fanatical. This is actually saying the opposite of that. In your dealings with outsiders, there will always be pressures to conform, to fit in, to maybe win the approval or to be well thought of by outsiders. He's saying here that you will need wisdom to live out your knowledge of God's will. It's gonna take wisdom to walk in a manner that's fully pleasing to God <clears throat> when you're immersed in a world with unbelievers. And certainly this is going to mean thinking about our behavior and our relationship with unbelievers and considering the consequences of our conduct. And so he says in verse five, make the most, making the most of the opportunity. So <clears throat> Christians, as an expression of practical wisdom, it says here, making the most of, which means to buy up. It means to make the most of every opportunity that we have to disclose something about the Christian faith. The word translated here, opportunity, essentially denotes a point of time in contrast to duration, meaning the time when God opens the door. There's the opportunity. It's the same type of thing that Paul was praying for himself. God wants us to make the most of the opportunity that he opens up. And then in verse six, he offers some very practical ways to do this. He says, <clears throat> let your speech always be with grace as though seasoned with salt so that you'll know how to, you should respond to each person. Now Paul here, <clears throat> Paul is speaking here <clears throat> not of preaching the gospel, but very general conversation. Believers' speech must always be with grace. To speak with grace here means, and I quote, to say what is spiritual, wholesome, fitting, kind, sensitive, purposeful, gentle, truthful, loving, and thoughtful. Think about Ephesians 4.29. Let no unwholesome word proceed out of your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. Notice he says, <clears throat> let it be seasoned with salt. The, so the speech of the new man must be seasoned with salt. Now there's a lot of opinions as to what this means. The context tells us that it corresponds to the opportunity that we've been given. Salt would be the thing that we add to the encounter from the open door. And salt also suggests insertion of things into the conversations, into the conversation that changes the taste. It changes the flavor, it alters the flavor, just like salt does. Believers must know how to respond to each person. They have to know 
what's the right thing to say and at what time should they say it? Think about Peter's words again. They have to be ready to make a defense to everyone who asks to give an account for the hope that's in you, <clears throat> yet to do it with gentleness and reverence. So I find this to be very instructive. Living with wisdom toward outsiders, those who are outside of Christ is what it's referring to. Walking in wisdom, looking for those moments. Do we look for these opportunities? Do we look for the open door? Do we seize those moments? I know many of us do. <clears throat> but that is something that we should be praying for. There might be unbelievers that we're around a lot that maybe we've never said a word to. Ask the Lord, Lord, give me an opportunity. You guys know that I like to carry tracks around. <clears throat> I give out tracks everywhere. And the reason that I do, number one, it puts something in their hands they can read. That's number one. That's a good thing. But number two, if it's a place that I frequent a lot, handing someone a track can open the door to say something to them later on. You might ask them, hey, did you read that thing I gave you? I have these things that I carry. I don't have one with me right now. It's in my wallet. But I have these things that I carry. They're thank you cards. I give thank you cards to every place that I go and buy something at. Every time. I think every time. And all it says on the front is thank you. And so it's, it's very disarming. You just, hey, thank you for your service. And you hand it to them and they see, oh, it just says thank you. And they go, thank you. I always get a big smile when I give it to them. Now, they might not smile when they flip it over and it has the gospel on the other side. But initially, I hand it with thank you side up so that they won't, so that they'll take it. <clears throat> but there's lots of little ways that we can be used as an evangelist. There's lots of ways, conversation starters. Tracks are one of my favorite. <clears throat> it could be something that you wear, but look for a way to start a conversation. Look for a way to share your faith. Look for a way that you can open your mouth and say something to someone about the good news that you believe, that we believed, that saved us because we owe it to them. We're commanded to do it. It's something that God wants us to do. Think of their fate if they die in their sins. Yes, God does want that to weigh on us. He wants us to think about it. So brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I am sure you've probably heard better presentations of why it is we should evangelize. But I give, have given you two weeks now of food for thought things to think about. We've looked at numerous verses on the issue. And I want to encourage you, some of the passages that we've covered, put them to memory. Put them to memory, store them away in the heart. <clears throat> Lord, help me to open the eyes of my heart. Help me not to be so entrenched in the busyness of my life, just doing the things that I need to do. Mowing the lawn, doing my record keeping, whatever the case may be. These are legitimate things that we do, but sometimes we're so focused on <clears throat> the next duty that I have <clears throat> that we lose sight of the fact, hey, wait a minute, God wants to use me. There are also opportunities to go out on Sundays to witness. That's a great way <clears throat> to obviously to go out and evangelize. But seriously, it's something that God wants to, to make a part of our everyday lives. That evangelism isn't just an event. It's just what we do all the time because we're thinking about it all the time. And God wants us to have a heart for the lost. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's stand. <clears throat> Father, help us, we pray. Help us, God. Help us to want those open doors. Lord, maybe there might be somebody here, Lord, who is very deficient because their walks are just not where, there should, where they should be. Lord, for that individual, please help them, God. 
help them to maintain lives of prayer and devotional and reading and studying the word. Lord, help us to want to be equipped so that we are ready when you do open the door. For those of us who just feel inadequate, Lord, help us to not feel that way, Lord. Help us to realize that we hold the keys to the kingdom. And Lord, you will give us the words to say. And you will give us the verses that we can memorize, as you already have. Lord, we have everything that we need to live lives of godliness, Lord. All things pertaining to life and godliness, we have. So Father in, help, Father in heaven, I pray that you would help us to be a people, Lord, who want to reach the lost. And Lord, that is my prayer for this body and for myself and for my family, Lord. And I thank you for this time in your word. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you guys.